since I was 14, which means, you know, only six years now. So I don't know what I could teach you guys, but there's a possibility. So my name is Urvashi, rhymes with Hershey. Um, if you can't remember that, I have a Starbucks name. It's Gracie, which is my, which is my dog. Um, I'm going to give you a quick background. Yes, I do have a degree in experimental psychology. This is the geekiest thing you have ever seen in your life. But I actually did use it in my job. So I worked as a research scientist for universities for a while. Your tax dollars at work. Thank you for supporting me in my youth. Uh, and then I actually went in into direct marketing agencies and uh, I created businesses for them from scratch. Um, so basically, I would go in into a place that had no analytics, no business at all, and I uh, have three or four times now taken them from zero to nine million dollars in about three or four years. So that's kind of the background that I'm bringing to this. Six years ago, I decided I was tired of working for the man. I am a woman, I do a great job, do not need that. Um, and I started my own company, it's called Tassiologic. It's a data-driven marketing company. So if you ever have a need to understand what a polynomial lag distributed model is, I'm your girl, I'm your girl for that one. Um, that, that business also, I grew from uh, zero to probably a cumulative revenue in five years of about $15 million. The only reason I mention this is because it is achievable. I came to this country at 20, I had two suitcases, I had $20 and the promise of a scholarship. So if I could do it, anybody in this room could do it. Yes? You, ca you can't hear me? I'm like the loudest mouth ever. All right. At 6 a.m. she really is. So this title is completely wrong. Since we did this title, I actually finished one more cookbook. So it's uh, 800 recipes for eight books in 29 months. I know it sounds crazy, but there's a method to my madness, and I want you to just follow along, suspend disbelief, uh, and ask questions as we go. All right, there's five things that you have to do. And by the way, I'm talking about this for a cookbook, but think about this as creating content for your blog. There are five things you need to do. You need to plan the whole book before you put pen to paper. Before you walk in the kitchen, you need to plan the whole book, and I'm going to show you how to do that. You're going to have to learn to write without actually cooking. You're going to need to learn to write recipes without being in the kitchen, which for me was the hardest thing. The delegate without fearing. I will talk a little bit more about that. The only way to achieve this much work in one go is to redefine what financial success is, and I'll talk to you about that. And then, of course, marketing. We all know how important this is. Can you guys hear me in the back now? OK, good. So planning the book. Here's the thing. Non-negotiable, you must put down an entire table of contents before you begin if you intend to be able to delegate the work. The, the, the reasons it was important for me is because firstly, I had to figure out how many new recipes I needed to create. So let's say that you're, you're given a cookbook offer and you already have 40 recipes on your blog and you're gonna do it. Well, there's gonna be sections. There's gonna be chicken, there's gonna be vegetables, there's gonna be this, that. You need to know how many you're going to have to write. So, what I typically do is I come up with a theme for what it is that I want to write, and I write out the entire table of contents. Now, this is flexible. I can go back and change it. I change my mind a lot, but I have to start there. Here's why you need it. If you're ever going to pitch a book, the editor, the publisher, likely will be more convinced if you can say, look, I have thought this through. I know exactly what I'm doing. Here's the table of contents, by golly. Let me tell you, my editor has never gone back and checked what I actually did against what I proposed to do. So don't confuse, do not confuse selling with implementation, y'all. There's a huge gap and nobody cares, okay? Sell it the way you need to and then go back and do the recipes that make the most sense to you at that time. It's gonna help you figure out what recipes need to be created. I talked about balancing the categories, but here's the other thing that makes it really helpful for me is that it helps me to batch cook. So like if I have something that has mushrooms in it, I'll buy mushrooms and I'll do all of the mushroom recipes that week because I know I have it in place. My family is only two people. I end up feeding four people from all of the recipes, but they all get mushrooms that week and that's just how it goes. Yeah, you're gonna get free food, you can't bitch. <laughs> The other thing is, you need to know how many recipes you're testing each week. You get ridiculous timelines. By the way, I curse, so if I curse, like just either pretend you didn't notice it or come and tell me you're my tribe, one of the two. Those are the only options. Um, I, I take the recipes that I have to create, I divide it by the number of weeks, and I go, I gotta do five a day or three a day. And it'll put some discipline around your cooking in a way that you'll just know that it's achievable. And I think that's the main thing. It's so intimidating to think of having to create 100 recipes in three months and you're sitting there going, I don't know how to do this. You know how to do it, three recipes a day. That's how you do it. 
But the main thing is it prepares you to write recipes without actually having cooked. How many people in here write a recipe before they actually make it? What's wrong with the rest of you slackers? <laughs> Seriously, you can't, you, see here's the thing. So when I learned to cook, I never follow a recipe. I can't follow my own recipe. If we ever have to reshoot it for making a video out of it, I have to hire someone else to do it. Because I'm like, you know what? This would be so much better with twice the spice. Like it just does not work. But unless you learn to do this, you will never be able to delegate. You have to have the recipe written. You have to be able to hand it off to someone because essentially for mine, I've had help from one or maybe two other people and I'll explain how they've helped me in the past. So table of contents, non-negotiable, right? Without cooking, you're going to have to teach yourself to cook at the computer, not at the kitchen. When I first started doing this, I had no clue what I was doing. Uh, about seven out of the 10 recipes I wrote on paper needed massive reworking, but they worked. Now, nine out of 10 of the recipes that I write work the first time, and the 10th one, for some reason, takes three or four times. This is my magic number. It's either one or four. I'm sorry, I just can't get in the middle somehow. For those of you who are wondering how you're gonna do this, so here's, people ask me, how do you come up with all of these recipes? How do you come up with all of these ideas? I eat a lot. Like, I just eat a lot. I just don't think there's any better way than to experience it. You, so I go out to restaurants a lot. And you know, I, I have a gastric sleeve. I can't eat more than a cup of food at a time, but that one cup really needs to be good. I'm not wasting my calories on shit, basically. <laughs> so what I end up doing, I can't follow recipes, but I read recipe books from end to end like they were novels. So I'll just flip through every single recipe, and what I'm looking for is flavor combinations that go together. So I'll look at that and go, that's interesting. I would have never thought of combining zucchini and mint move on and then three days later I might end up making a salad out of it when the recipe I originally saw was a stew, but it's a flavor combination that's been suggested to me. I am a geek, I think there's no doubt about this. I read Wikipedia articles for, to understand flavor profiles in different countries. So I'll read those and, see, and I'll look at Lebanese cooking and see what kind of spices are usually used together. And so I will look at those and try to educate myself on what flavors other people combine. Not recipes, not quantities, but flavor profiles. And pretty soon you start to think, you know, this particular lavender thing is gonna go really well in a creme brulee, which you may not have thought about otherwise. I take notes constantly. I have at last count 1,556 notes in my phone app, and they're all bucketed into different uh, folders. So like I'll be in the middle of a perfectly reasonable civil conversation. I'll go, wait a minute, wait a minute instant pot chili mac. Like, I, it's, it's, it's rude, but it's, it's what works. So what I do is I separate it out, and besides, anybody who knows me, it's like I, I, am, I have ADD in the worst way, so I have to multitask constantly. But I have, I have little folders that I create, keto recipes, chaffle recipes, keto cookie recipes, instant pot recipes, health, healthy recipes, vegetarian recipes, and I just make a note of the headline of what it is. So I went out to meet my son yesterday, and he ordered a um, green chili mac and cheese. And at the risk of offending 99% of the people in this room, it was white people food. Like there was no flavor in this food, I have to be honest. I looked at that and I was like, I could nail that sucker. So I wrote that down and I'm gonna make a, a green chili mac and cheese that's gonna be a lot more flavorful. So that idea, but not that flavor, not that concept, and I wrote it down and now I have it in my memory. So when it's time to create a table of contents, I go through my notes and I copy and paste and go, this, I think this one is gonna work. You have to start looking for patterns. And I know that this, is, this doesn't come easily, but you know, in my cooking, I have realized that if I'm making Indian food, for example, for every pound of meat, I end up using a cup of onion, a tablespoon of ginger, a tablespoon of garlic, and you know, a, a complement of spices. If I'm doing uh, Tex-Mex, I always have cumin, um, you know, I, sometimes I use coriander, I typically use cilantro, I typically use jalapenos. Now this may not be how you cook, but there are principles, there are heuristics, there are rules of thumb that you can derive. Every cup of beans, for me, takes a teaspoon and a half of salt. So you need to start looking for these patterns and go, what is the combination that goes together? What are the flavors that go together? What do other countries do? And this is how you're gonna come up with 800 ideas, because it can't all be green chili, mac and cheese, or the food that your mother made when you grew up. You're gonna have to go beyond the things that you feel comfortable with. So the way to start with this is first, I'm, for the, those of you who have not written it, look at this example. Let's say that you're, uh, I'm asking you to write down a meatloaf recipe. You kind of know what goes in a meatloaf, most of us, right? Like it's, unless you're vegetarian. Uh, but it's, it's typically some kind of ground meat. There's eggs in there. There's sometimes breadcrumbs, salt, pepper. Some people use onion soup mix. There's these various combinations. Just write down the ingredients. That's your first step. After that, try, when you feel comfortable with that and you put all the flavors down, as a next step, after you've done this five or 10 times, try to put in the amounts. 
and guess at the amounts. This is not written in stone. Take that recipe with you and try to feel and say, I think I need a little bit more, a little bit less. So for those of you who are already doing this, I know you're thinking, I cannot believe I'm sitting here listening to this woman talk about it. But let me tell you, it was a huge thing for me. Like I cooked with my hands. I had kinesthetic memory. I cooked with, with feel. And it was a huge chore for me to do this. So you're smart. The rest of us are having to learn. How about that? Then you can start to write down cook times. The reason that this is important is without this, you can't delegate. OK, this is very, very tough. Let me tell you something. If there was Olympics for being a control freak, I would beat everybody's ass in here. Like, I would win this in space. I am a control freak. I am, and most of them, who, who here does not think they're one? Yeah, there you go. All <laughs> entrepreneurs, everybody who starts their own business, we want to control the outcome of this. Nevertheless, I have managed to hire four or 500 people in my lifetime, and they have all been rock stars, with the exception of 10% that I had to fire. So one thing I want you to understand is that in a successful business, it is not unusual to fire 25% of your workforce because they were not appropriate. So my, my track record was about 5 to 10%. And my boss got on me all the time saying, you're, be, you're not taking enough risks. You're not stepping out enough. So my rejoinder to you is you're not a control freak, you just haven't found the right people. So the issue isn't whether or not you're trying to be controlling, the issue is have you found the right people to delegate it to. So let me talk about this a little bit. So there are certain things that you will never be able to delegate. I cannot delegate my main job. If somebody was capable of doing what I was doing, they would be doing what I was doing. They wouldn't be working for me. And this is not a talent issue. It's sometimes it's where you are in your stage of life. Sometimes it's that a person isn't willing to make an investment. Sometimes it is that they have three ch children. Sometimes it is that they need a steady income. There are multiple reasons why not everybody wants to be an entrepreneur and be out there. So you cannot delegate your main job, but there are things you can delegate. I chose a friend of mine who was 70 years old and had been cooking since he was 20. So he had, more exp he had been cooking longer than I've been alive. Here was someone I did trust. He was local. I would give him my recipes. He would make them. They would bring them over on a Sunday, and we would all sit down and eat them, which, when I was doing the keto desserts book, was quite interesting, because lunch oftentimes was four desserts. We all put on so much weight that those six months, I can't tell you. Um, one of the other things that I have a lady doing for me right now is she'll come in and she'll clean up. So like she'll help me. I'll write the recipe. I'll hand it to her. She'll just put the ingredients in bowls. She's not even cooking. She's just putting the ingredients in bowls for me. I'll eyeball that and I'll go, that looks good. That doesn't look good. I'll add a little bit more of this. And if it's something as simple as pour it in the Instant Pot, she can do that. Like anybody can do that after I've looked at the ingredients and she cleans. And because I had her, her alone, I tested the last 100 recipes in 21 days. I never want to do that again. And by the way, not just test it, I had to write them in 21 days. It was, a, it, was, it was hectic, but it got done. I was done with it. I was able to go on a culinary tour to Thailand and eat my way across the country. It was blissful. <laughs> Photography. So the, one of the things that was very, very difficult for me is like I'm all about efficiency. And what I really wanted to do was I wanted to test the recipe. I wanted to make a video of it at the same time, and I wanted it photographed. OK, you cannot make six videos a day and six photographs and six. It's not going to work. Trust me, I have tried it. My husband and I have gotten into raging fights over it because he's like, what, what the hell are you doing? Especially because he does the photographs. So he had a say in this thing. So one thing that I have had to do is I've had to divorce the video making entirely from the recipe cooking. When I'm cooking for testing recipes, I'm just doing that. Then the, the cleaner lady, the cleaner help, um, happens to be very, very um, good with arranging food. She arranges the food, my husband takes the photographs. That's the only way that I can make this work. Otherwise, it's like trying to do it all is not going to work. Sometimes, by the way, on the testers, like I make food from other countries, and I'm not always sure that I got the flavor right. And so I do have in my Facebook group, I'll ping someone and say, who's familiar with Nigerian food? Could you taste this for me? And someone will taste it, and they'll give me feedback, and that helps me out. And then I can say, look, I know this is an authentic flavor profile. And in my case, it's important because the way I cook is not traditional. So um, you know, I went to school. I, did a great job with my career. I was CMIO of the largest ad agency in this country, and what am I known for? Frickin' butter chicken. Okay, <laughs> like whatever. The universe is just cruel sometimes, let me tell you. Um, that is not made in a traditional fashion. So I have doubters that I have to convince, and the ability to say, look, this recipe has been tested. The ability to say with confidence when you get a nasty comment, dude, you're the stupid one, the recipe works, right? <laughs> like that is, that is powerful, it's faith in yourself, and you can stand up for that recipe, and you, know, the, the, you can address it in a way that conveys confidence. So those testers are super important. I also um, parse out my video editing. 
I have someone who works for the local TV news. Um, he does the video, video editing on the side. Uh, we have three VAs that work. Sammy's one of them. Um, she, they all work to help keep the blog going. So essentially, I take many of the recipes, uh, and the deal I make with my publishers is that um, many of those recipes are going to be on the blog, and that's part of marketing it. So I, I have a, an issue with health only belonging to people that can afford to buy my books. You know, not very many people can afford to buy eight times $20 worth of books. And a lot of what I'm writing are keto recipes for people who are diabetic or for people who are trying to lose weight. So you can repurpose the content to some extent, and that's a negotiation that you will need to have. Recipe editors, I am shit at writing recipes. Like, I can write it, but I can't write it in this methodical, systematic fashion. So I pay a company to go in after I've written the, the recipe and edit it so that it's absolutely done according to traditional formats. Yes, it costs me money, it saves me a lot more time, and my editor and I have not killed each other over it. So there are, there are things that you can outsource that you don't know. And by the way, I, one thing I learned, which is quite news to me, was apparently you can pay people to do all of your recipes. Some of the big franchises that are putting out six and eight and 10 books, they essentially go to a company, they hire out all of the work, they get a book back, and they write the introduction. So I was offered this, and I was like, why? I mean, it, it, it didn't work for me, but it could work for you, and it could work for you in a, in a different way, which is a supplement. So typically, I think they charge you somewhere between $100 and $150 for a tested recipe, and it's a way for you to go out and get different flavors, different tastes, um, and, and other things in your book. And of course, the photo team. So let me tell you, all of you bloggers who are here, who are sitting here and thinking, I'm just going to do my own photos exactly how I do them for the, for the blog, and it's going to work in a book. A backlit photograph needs very different properties from something that's going to go on print. So you really need to think about that and think about the photography that you have in your blog and the photography that you have in your cookbook. You may be an adept photographer, but you will have to change your styles for those typically. I'm a little bit in the weeds here, but you know, you're all going to be famous authors. You need to know this shit. <laughs> Read it to find financial success. Let me tell you something. If you make a 30% margin in corporate America, you are a rock star. You are an absolute rock star. All of us who are sitting in here, many of us have thought that as a blogger, the way for me to make an income is to keep 100% of everything I make. Okay? Maybe that's the way to do it. Maybe that's not the way to do it. I'm going to talk to you about the two different alternatives that we have to answer and face for yourself. The first question you're going to have to ask yourself is, am I an individual contributor or am I an empire grower? Am I trying to build a business or am I trying to make a living? How many of you are wanting to build a business? OK. And how many of you think this is a way for me to make a living? OK. Those are both legitimate answers. So let me, I'll give you a personal example. I created this company. I was t stealing uh, business from all of the big advertising agencies. I would go and I would pitch, and I took McDonald's from people, I took Fidelity from people. You know, I went against all of the big boys and took all of their business. And uh, in order to shut me up, they offered to buy my company. Now, I had been told repeatedly, Urvashi, what you need to do is you need to create this company. Within three years, you need to sell it. And by the way, you can't do a service business. You need to do a software business, because that's, there's all these rules that I was told. So then they came by and they said, hey, we want to buy your company. And I said, how much? And they said, five years, $50 million. And everybody was like, oh my god, you got to sell, you got to sell, McDonald's will go away tomorrow. And I looked at that and I thought, you know, I don't need $50 million. Like, I don't know, what would I do? My husband would go buy a plane and kill himself. Like, it's not worth <laughs> it. It's just not what I want to do with my life. And I would be giving away five years of my life to someone else, and I would be on a plane all the time, and I have a degenerative disease that's, you know, that's progressing, and so I can't really travel as much. So I turned down that deal and everybody was like, are you crazy? Like, people live for this. Other people live for it, it was not what I wanted. And I'm an empire builder. Like I ran my first successful business at 14. So I'm, all I'm trying to tell you with this is that there are legitimate choices and there are legitimate reasons why you might choose to go one way or the other. But that is the first question you're going to have to answer. If you're trying to build a business, you are looking at 25 to 30 percent profit margin. So you have to look at everything that you're doing and saying 70 percent of this is cost of running business. And if I do that, I'm successful. The math is quite simple. Typically, most of us bill, if you're billing, you're billing about 1,800 hours a year. So essentially, at a 30% margin, if you just found enough work and revenue for three people, that would have covered you already. And everything else is, is going to be gravy on top. So to outsource your hours is super simple. And to get that money back is super simple if you have a business mind, but only if you're willing to take a 30% margin. Is this making sense? 
there's also a, a tipping point. So for most of us, you're at this awkward point where you can't quite afford to pay someone and you can't quite get to do the work yourself. And it's at that point that you're gonna have to say, look, I'm gonna have to invest right now, and this is for, for my blog personally, this is the year when I'm putting in a ton of money and not making that much. In full transparency, my VAs are probably making more on just the blog than I am right now. And the reason that I'm doing that is because I need to saturate it with content to the point where my top line will grow without my, my uh, expenses increasing. So at a certain point, I'm creating enough content and as the traffic goes up over time, I'm gonna make that money back. If you're gonna to try to create a book and do a blog and raise a family and have any kind of a personal life, you're gonna to have to look hard and look at how much money you're willing to give away. Your book advance, how much of that are you willing to give away in order to be able to accomplish this, the stellar growth that you need? By the way, I have never gone in debt for a business. Everyone has been profitable day one. I've never borrowed money for any of it. So it is doable. I'm not asking you to go in debt. I'm asking you to take a little bit less from the top line so that you can have sanity and so that you can actually grow the business. You are not gonna make money on your first book unless you are a massive blogger. If you have uh, like a five million, you know, uh, five million views a month, um, if you've got a huge massive uh, Facebook group, if you've got all of these things, you will have a, a very good chance. In fact, um, Barbara here introduced me to my agent, which was very nice. And I have subsequently introduced two other bloggers to that, that agent. Both of them were much bigger than me. And all of these ladies, Barbara and the, the other two, were much bigger, much more successful bloggers, and they were able to hire an agent. When I picked up the phone, they were like, yeah, we don't know who you are. We're not gonna talk to you. Nobody wanted, nobody's gonna talk to you uh, as an agent unless you have a massive social following. So you cannot be in the book game for one book. You just absolutely cannot. Some of you have seen the article in the New York Times. I can't go into a lot of it because I ended up having to hire lawyers. Uh, but essentially, I was offered three to five thousand dollars for the first book, and this was at a time when I had been blogging for six months, and uh, you know nobody knew who I was. I barely knew who I was. I was a scientist, and then I was cooking. And people who worked for me for 20 years were like, "You can cook?" I was like, "Who do you think feeds my kids? Of course I can cook." So it was a very, very tumultuous time. And what I ended up doing was saying, "Keep your five thousand. Just give me royalties." So I bet on myself on that one. And just, you know, full transparency, I ended up making $60,000 on the first two books, but they had offered me 5,000. So I was willing to bet on myself and go, 5,000 isn't gonna change my life today. You know, a successful book and 60,000, now you're talking vacation money, at least for the next several vacations, right? So again, you have to ask yourself, why am I willing to do this? It is not gonna be for the money unless you're a big blogger to start with. My groceries, 20 bucks per recipe. You're creating 100 recipes. The recipe testing and writing, 10 hours plus 10 recipes, you're looking at another 1,000 hours. You have to write a lot more than just recipes. There's a front and a back to the book. Um, you have to edit, you have to check galleys, photo shoots. I'm, I'm going up to New York next week for a photo shoot. There's a week of my time where I just sit in a room with these people taking photographs. So you cannot do the first book for the money, typically, but if you make a good success out of your first book, the money will come. Because many people make you know, uh, 50,000, 60,000, 70,000, 100,000 in advances after their books have been successful, but you will not. Your first offer is likely gonna be 3,000, 5,000, 8,000. If it's 3,000, you just PM me on Facebook and send me the offer and I will write an email for you that will get you 8,000. I've done that four times now. <laughs> so yeah, don't take 3,000. You are probably not gonna earn more than the advance is what I have discovered. And this is not just my experience. I've talked to 25 people. Your first book, you'll probably not get more than the advance. And you cannot look at that and say, look, you know, I, if I created these recipes on my blog, I would make more on ad traffic. Yes, you would, but that's not why you're doing this. You're doing this because it's a brand builder. You're doing this because you've always wanted to have a book. You're doing this because you intend to create six books after this. Those are legitimate reasons for doing it. Because I will make more money is not actually in this day and age. In an age where people expect content for free, that is not working for any of us. Anybody wants to disagree, has questions? My agent said to me, why don't we just see how your books do and then you can call me back. And I was like, dude, I've sold like whatever it was at that point. And she, you know, at that, at that point, you can start to have a very different conversation. An agent will talk to you and uh, you can actually go talk to big publishers. So I am uh, by trade a marketer. I run, uh, I create CRM strategies for Fortune 50s, Fortune 100s. So I know how this works. 
but it's very different to tell my client what to do when they have a team of 25 people versus me doing it for myself. Every hour I spend creating content, we probably, that's an understatement, I probably spend four to five hours more getting it. So I see a lot of comments at Food Blogger Central and Media Mind, people going, how do you get more traffic? I have all these recipes. Let me tell you something, everybody in this room has recipes. It is not about the recipes, it's about how you go out and spread the word on it. Here's everything that I have to do for a book. And I have to admit, I've slacked off on the last few books because I've been too busy creating the next one. I have to create excitement. I have to ask for testers. I share exclusive recipes. I believe in giving people as much stuff as I can for free, so I don't have products right now uh, that I'm asking them to buy outside of the books. So if they pre-order a book, I'll give them five free recipes from the book just ahead of time, like as a little teaser. I run a lot of giveaways with other people. I have to encourage pre-orders. I have to work with bloggers. And I think the most important thing is, you can't just say, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book endlessly. Or you could, but people would tune you out really fast. It needs to be a multifaceted message, and you're going to have to figure out what these communication pillars are. So, for example, when I did the Indian cookbook, um, the three pillars I used was heritage, nostalgia, and ease. I grew up eating these recipes. I would really like to share them with you. Don't you remember when your mom used to make this recipe? Wouldn't you like to make it again? These are so easy that somebody who's never even eaten Indian food could make it. Now I'm talking about a lot more different value propositions that I can offer someone. So your three communication pillars, four communication pillars, you're going to have to figure those out. Innovation, efficiency, education, entertain, elegant, inexpensive. Whatever this is, if you can't summarize what you do, the unique value proposition that you have, and three conceptual pillars, you need to sit down and do that work first. Because you cannot just say, buy my book, buy my book. And by the way, this is true for your recipes. You can't just go, oh my god, this is the best mushroom stroganoff. Guess what? I just said that last week. And six other people have said it. So it needs to go beyond that in your messaging. This is the most important thing that I think people don't necessarily understand. You're not selling recipes, y'all. We've all got recipes. It's something else. It's that X factor. It's what else are you selling? And the way that we, I have asked clients to answer this question typically is, imagine if you did not exist in the world. Forget about your family. Imagine if you did not exist in the world, how would your followers' lives be different? Have you ever thought about that, anybody? I can answer for myself, and it sounds self-serving, but it, 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 this is based, it's fact-based. If I had not existed, there were many people who would have never eaten or bothered to cook Indian food uh, for my followers, because that's not what they were doing. It isn't to say that other people weren't doing it, but for my followers, this is what I offered them. If I wasn't doing it, I would not have had 70-year-old women lose 50 pounds on my keto recipes. If I wasn't doing it, people would have never thought to go with me to India and to Thailand because they were curious about different countries. Okay, so I'm teaching you efficiency, I'm teaching you good health from cooking at home, I'm inspiring you with confidence, and I'm making you culturally curious. That's what I'm selling. I'm not selling recipes. My recipes kick ass, don't get me wrong, but that's not what I'm selling. Okay, you have to be able to answer this question for yourself. If you are not sure where you fall, one thing I would recommend is that you look up Jungian brand archetypes. Uh, every, of course, because I'm a geek, I have to do this. Uh, Carl Jung, uh, J-U-N-G, look up brand archetypes and try to pin yourself into one of those categories so you understand how you are um, viewed. So here's the thing, anybody can write a book. All you'd have to do is take 100 recipes off your blog and you would have a book. The issue is that not everybody can sell it. And the days when your publisher sent you out on book tours to go talk to everyone and sign books. Let me tell you, if I were to sign a book, like two people would show up and one of them would be my dog. Okay, like nobody's gonna show up. That's not how books are marketed anymore. It's all done online. And the thing that, I, that was important for me to understand is the publisher's got 20 other books. They don't care which one sells. I've only got that one, I've only got me. I don't have anybody else to bet on. So if that book is gonna be successful, you're the one that's gonna have to push it. And just keep in mind, you're not a recipe writer, you are a something else. You're gonna to have to fill in this button, an experience creator, an empower, a brand builder, an educator. One of the things that helped me clarify some of this was saying, what is this, and advertisers do this a lot, what is the moment of truth? What is the thing that makes you the happiest? When, my, when someone in my group comes and tells me that they ate only my recipes and lost weight, that makes me feel good. When someone comes in and says, hey, I made this thing, and my son, who's uh, autistic and is very fussy about food, ate this food because it was full of flavor, that makes me feel good. When someone comes and says, uh, your recipes are so easy, I look like a hero, that makes me feel good. Okay, so in, ask yourself, what is it that you find fulfilling, and then define your brand to be those things. I know you're thinking, what does this have to do with cookbook writing? It isn't about the writing. It isn't about the recipes. It's about how you go spread the word so that people buy your books. Okay, so for those of you who are not writing recipes on paper, 
do that first. Do that for your blog. Start batching the content. Divide up the content you want. Figure out how many days you have to create it. Start writing it. Start with just the ingredients first. Slowly add the amounts. Slowly add the instructions. At that point, you have something that's pitch worthy. Go out and pitch it. Understand that this is, the book business is not a one-shot one game. It's not, you're not going to make money off of the first book. And before you go out to the publisher, have your pitch down and be able to say something like, this is why my recipes are important. So I write a, a, in my book pitches, I write a paragraph and say, why does the world need this cookbook? If you can't answer that, they're not going to be able to answer it. So you need to have that value prop, and you need to be able to say, this is how I do things differently. You know, I don't use packaged goods, or I do use packaged goods. Uh, all of my dinners can be made with under 10 ingredients. Whatever it is, that value prop needs to be figured out. And then you need to, need to look at the business and figure out how much of this am I willing to give away in order to grow the business. And if the answer is nothing, that's fine. You can still do a book. You're going to be at a very, very different pace. And you have to accept that and as a conscious decision that you're making. So you're not going to be able to do 700 recipes in 24 months doing it by yourself. Like I said, I have someone who does the photographs. I have three VAs. I have uh, someone who edits the videos. I have another guy who makes the videos. Uh, and then the pho photography team for the book is 10 people that the publisher hires. So, you know, no woman is doing it by herself. I feel like I've been a little bit all over the place, but maybe not. No? Questions? Who feels like they could go out and write a book right now? <laughs> the rest of you, what is it? I, actually, I'm very curious. Why do you not think you could? Do you want to? I'm just going to pick on people because I'm a mean person. It doesn't have to be you. Does anybody, why do you feel like you couldn't? What is it that you feel is the issue? Yep? I think it's just a very nebulous term around big platform. Like, I don't know what that means, so automatically I think I don't have it. Yeah. So when you say that agents aren't going to look at you unless you have a big platform, how do you define big platform? Well, I mean, Barbara, I would love your opinion on this. When I did my first book and got offered an insulting $5,000 for it, um, I probably had maybe 200,000 page views, a little bit less. Um, the, the people that got an offer that I introduced them to had, <laughs> I want to cry when I say this, 5 million and 7 million. But these ladies had been blogging for seven years and 10 years. One thing I have learned, and you know, I, I create predictive models for a living, so I look at data in a very different way than a lot of other people probably do. Successful books, if you can, pre-orders really matter. If you feel like you could drive five to 600 pre-orders on Amazon, your book has a really good chance of coming up and popping up, okay? 500, 600 pre-orders, can I drive those? If you can drive those, you've got a shot. And let me tell you something, nobody's gonna come offer, well, they might come offer it to you, but they'll offer you $3,000. The only way you're gonna know is if you ask. You're going to have to ask. The worst they'll do is tell you no. Someone else will tell you. No to me is just the beginning of a conversation. It means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. No just means you've spoken to me. Let me continue this dialogue. That's it. You know? What else? What else do you feel like I can't do this? How many of you know what you're selling besides recipes? You want to say what? Yeah, yeah we... We're selling not just recipes, but also the support that goes with weight loss. Certainly for us. I mean, it's been a case of our recipes, especially in the form of a book, are just part of the bigger picture. Like our community is where people come for help and kind of they buy into it. That's, that's what it's about. It's just, it's a really quite a small, I mean, it's a big piece, but it's a small piece in the yes. bigger picture. Yeah. Yep. Somebody else? Anybody else? Yep. Ease. Yes. Moms, I'm yes. selling ease for moms. Yes. Yeah. So in the pitch, you know, in a pitch like that, like I think it's really, very simple where you can show four recipes that you've taken that might take an hour, you know, uh, and say, you know, I take simple recipes like this and I convert it into a weeknight dinner. Like now you've got a pitch. Now you've got something to sell. Now you have something that makes you stand out from everybody else. And ease, by the way, is a, a huge platform to talk about. Ease could be, ease could translate to products. Ease could translate to the, the kitchen tools that I use. Ease could translate to the number of ingredients I have in there. Ease could translate to I make recipes that your children want to help you cook. Ease, could Ease has a platform with legs. Like you can actually convert this into a whole bunch of different. I really feel like I really want to run a workshop where we sit down and I find out the value props with you, and that would be more fun. But that's a different, different topic, right? I'll do it for you in a heartbeat. <laughs> Yes. Can you talk a little bit about your routine or 
No, I understand. Like, that. like basically, if you yeah. you wrote all those cookbooks, right? Like, yeah. How did you divide your days? How did you divide all you did? Yeah. So I have. Yeah, I have OCD. So like if when I focus on something, I'm hyper focused. Like I'm I have massive ADD. Like I have to do multiple things at a time, but I'm hyper focused. When I start, I'm just gonna keep doing it until it's done. So there's uh, the routine has been difficult. So what I'll do is I'll say how many recipes do I need to do every day for the next three months in order to get this book done, and then how much time do I need for the photo shoot? How much time do I need to buy? So I break down my calendar into the number of recipes, and then in a particular day I might make three, I may, might make five. And so typically what I have to do is, uh, and this is because of my disease, I have rheumatoid arthritis, and so I'll flare by the end of the day. So I have to go in in the beginning of the morning and I have to cook. And then in the afternoon, I can sit down and I answer uh, comments on the blog. I harass my VAs about what they're up to. Like all of that stuff happens in the afternoon when I need a break. And in the evening, then I've got to get back online because my audience is online and they're talking. So that's kind of how I have to divide it up is when does it work for my body? When does it work for my household? And when does it work for my audience? You know? But the, I mean, there are times when they don't hear from me at all because it's like I'm heads down cooking, I can't answer a question. And by the way, I still have another job, so I'm still running Tassio. So sometimes it's like I have to go from making low carb chicken biryani to explaining to a client why their whole entire marketing policy sucks, right? Like, so it's a bit of a transition. Yep. What are your thoughts on self publishing? So it has worked extremely well for a lot of people. Um, I know I spoke to someone who created. Uh, an ebook, she has a, a decent, she has a big platform, but she created this ebook and made $30,000 last month. One month, okay, on a thing. My personal perspective is that you have to be able to sell the books on your own. For me, even, at, even after all these books, what really makes a book successful for me is if, if my uh, publisher can get it into Costco and Sam's. Mm -hmm. If they can't and we're hawking it on Amazon, they can just say goodbye to their advance. So I try to come up with books that I think are gonna fit in the larger platforms. So you have to have a very strong distribution, whether that is through affiliates with other bloggers, whether that's through your own platform. You know? And people look at that and go, the publisher's gonna pay me $1.80, I could make $8. Yeah, but you're not gonna sell eight times the books on your own unless you have a massive marketing platform. The other thing that I'm struggling with a little bit is I have some ideas of things that are not commercial, commercially viable and I really wanna do an ebook. But here's the problem. I'm gonna create an ebook with crappy photographs made at home in a PDF because otherwise print costs are gonna be really high. I'm gonna ask somebody to pay $14 and next month I'm gonna turn around and ask them to pay $20 for a beautiful, gorgeous, fully photographed, properly edited book. Like my brand really gets confused then and the value prop for people, like I'm paying the same amount, why am I getting two vastly different quality books? So I have chosen to stay away from that right now. So I have my long, long way of saying you need to pick a path to go down. Like if you're gonna do self-publish first with the expectation. So let me tell you how, how I did my Indian book. So nobody knew who I was. I barely knew I could cook. I created an ebook. I sold 2,000 of it for $4.95. Uh, I took that sale and I went to Instant Pot and said, you know, you guys should sponsor me. Like I just sold 2,000 and nobody even knows who I am. Imagine what we could do if we just did this together. I sell, this is what I do for a living, I sell. Actually, my husband says the only reason I have eight books is because I can't stop myself from selling the next one. And he's not wrong. Like I like to sell, I don't like to actually cook all of, for all of them, I love to sell it. Um, so I use that as an entree. So if you're using a, a, an ebook as an entree to do it, I think it works very well. But there are many, many bloggers that make a really good living out of just doing ebooks. Um, and many of them, by the way, you know, if you do like meal plans or smaller things, or uh, I did one, uh, 10 ways to play with yogurt, and I sold that for 99 cents and I sold a few. But this was early on in my career. So it's not, I feel like it's a very legitimate way to get started. Let me tell you something, do not, do not do this unless you understand the different formats. I went through this whole routine. You need to understand uh, KDP, Kindle Desktop Publishing, before you do it. And that, by the way, is something worth outsourcing to someone else. So don't create a PDF. I know people tell you to do that. If you ever want distribution on Amazon, you're going to be redoing that PDF. Ask me how I know. <laughs> yeah. What else? So I've heard from some big bloggers that they're not <laughs> sure that they should even do books just because um, the amount coming in is not as much like efficient. Yeah, yeah, of yeah, 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 yeah. So, so can, I'm just going to be transparent because I feel like there's people hide too much shit in this business. <laughs> I made half a million dollars last year top line on books, and that's just on advances for three or four, uh, and that's because the books sell. So if you feel like you can make that off of your blog, you're right, you shouldn't. The other thing is I have sold 400,000 books, and they're not all to the same people either. 
So I feel like it's helped my blog grow quite a bit in, in, the, in the sense that people come back. It's given me credibility. If you go to my press page and look at my backlink profile, I have a huge backlink profile because I get featured in Food 52, Bon Appetit, all of these things. And I am not your 20-year-old sexy one with big boobs, right? That's not me. Like, I don't fit, I don't fit the typical media demographic, right? But it's happening. So I think it's really a trade-off. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't do the books just for the money. Like it's, it's too much work, and and I stress massively, and I feel like a failure every single goddamn day. That the, the day the books launch, nobody wants to talk to me for three days. Like I am a complete freaking mess because I'm like, oh my god, this is the one that's gonna fail. My husband's like, uh huh. Yeah, Sammy's watched me through all of this. It's it's absolutely nerve-wracking. It's who you are put on the line, and the fact is, you are going to fail someday. Nobody sells books endlessly. So like you are on a short leash here, y'all. You got 15 minutes, do it right. So you have to have like a tough skin. I, I got a stupid comment on my air fryer book. This book is great for someone who needs spices. I don't like spices. Bitch, did you read the description? It said, <laughs> I mean, it's insane shit. It says she uses spices in her cooking. You know, it's bullshit like that that you just gotta go, you know what, screw you, I'm doing it. You know, and my thing is, you know what, the day you can write a cookbook, you are allowed to comment on mine. But there are days you want to you crawl in a hole and die. You just want to crawl in a hole and die on some of those days. It is emotionally, nobody talks about this, everybody talks about the money. It is an absolute freaking emotional beating every day that that book launches. Until you hit 15,000 or 25,000, you sit in fear that this is the time you're going to fail for the first time in your life. It is not for, it's not for the faint of heart. Yep. I have a follow-up question. How much of um, traditional publishers tell you marketing the book? Because I've heard that... Zero. Zero. So you still have to sell it yourself? Of course you do. But if they get it in Costco, or they get it in Sam's, or they get it in Target, or they get it in Walmart, I can't do that. Is there a threshold for you to sell that many number of books for them to get these books? So you know, that's an interesting question. So, okay, you can't share this outside. Much of what I've said, you probably should not share outside this room, but... <laughs> so I did a... <laughs> whatever, whatever. Um, I live my life open. Um, I, uh, I created a book, and I created an air fryer book. It sold 50,000 copies at a time when people didn't know what an air fryer was. It was so successful that the outlet we created it for said, will you create us another one? And I was like, sure, I'll do another one. I did another one. It's out. And they said, yeah, we're not going to take it. I'm like, this is the book you asked for. But because they're a big publisher, we can't go out to them and say, you are going to take my book. So I have no recourse. So this was a book that was scheduled to be in there. My Keto Fat Bombs book was scheduled to be in there. And then they changed their mind, and they're allowed to do that. So there is no threshold. Now, people reassure me that if a book sells really well, it could go into Costco, Sam's, Target. I haven't seen that happen with mine. They either go in there or they don't go in there right now. And I live in fear for my next three books because I have no idea if they're going to get in there or not. I'm telling you, you think, you think blog comments are a mess? This thing will beat you. It will beat you down. If you, I mean, you know, a lot of people, their attitude is, hey, I got paid the advance. What do I care? I care. This is the problem. I care. Every day I care. You know, so you've got to figure out where you are. Would you ladies disagree that it's emotionally tough? Oh, this is mm -hmm. exhausting. I'm crying right now. This is like, <laughs> <laughs> like I yeah. like connected. So yes. Well. It's just like a, it's, it's, your heart is on the line. Yes. You're, you know, if you really love it. Yes. And which is the only reason why to do it because it's so much work. It's a lot of work. And of course you think it, when you're writing it, it's going to be a bestseller and everybody's going to love it and you're going to help people and you're going to be a rock star or whatever, whatever your dream is. And then when you find out that that is very hard to attain yes. without a, a level of persistence that you may not have. Yes. Or grit. Yes. Or thin enough skin. Yes. That is a wake up. And then you go and you stay in your bed for like a year. And yes. Yes. <laughs> but I want to add Oh, I mean, yeah. you're uplifted and you start <laughs> down. You really are No. <laughs> Beautifully, though. You just have to start with that first step. Yes. Do, do the table of contents. Is there a magic number for the table of contents that you should be shooting for? Like yes, yes. So all the, all the books that I've done, except for the first two, uh, they start at 100. And uh, invariably, I include another 10, 15 for spice mixes because I make my own. Uh, in the keto book, I gave them um, another 30 recipes for free and charts for different ways to use eggs or whatever it was. Uh, so yeah, you're looking at 100 recipes. Now some of the smaller houses, uh, Page Street, Callisto, people like that, 
people like that will do 50, 75, but then the advances are lower. And by the way, nobody in here, uh, except for Kay, should expect to get a hardback book, and therefore the advances are a whole lot lower. And the other thing I wanna tell you guys is that I did not understand what a successful book was, and nobody talks about this openly. A commercially successful book sells 25,000 copies. So your followers are, imp are necessary, but not sufficient. They're not sufficient. You're gonna have to sell to strangers. So something in the topic of the book needs to be something that appeals to strangers because it's not gonna be just your following. So typically the, the, the expectation is 100 recipes. Anything else?